I've actually wanted to do this presentation for a long time. Um, as a psychotherapist, you know, when I started doing this work myself, I started noticing the changes, noticing the benefits, and of course I, I tended to use a therapy lens to understand and see what was happening for myself and for people I was working with and things like that. Um, first thing I want to say is that Trillium is not a substitute for psychotherapy, right? It's not something you do instead of psychotherapy. Uh, it doesn't replace psychotherapy in any way. But I do believe that it opens us to a level of awareness that psychotherapy doesn't, right? How many people know who Abraham Maslow is? Oh. So Maslow is known for his hierarchy of needs, right? That he came up with this theory or this understanding that uh, we satisfy survival needs first, and then physical needs, and then self-esteem. Um, what was the top need in this hierarchy, if you remember? Self-actualization, right. His top need was self-actualization. What is self-actualization, right? Well, um, self-actualization is a state where you're living a very high quality of life, right? You're doing in the world what you want to be doing and are successful and that kind of thing. What most people don't know and what the textbooks don't know, you kind of touched on it a little bit, he actually added another need above self-actualization later on in his life. But the textbooks don't record that, unfortunately. The need he added on later on was self-transcendence, right? And what he found was that self-actualized people start to feel this sense of, is that all there is? There must be more. What does that remind you of in Trillium work, right? What does that remind you of, that sense of, this is it? Is that all there is? What? Yeah, it's the rot, right? It starts, that place of the uh, core paradox, right? It starts to be felt. And actually, that's what propelled someone into uh, self-transcendence. Interesting, it's fascinating, right? That he was able to kind of see that there was movement, there was another level of human development above self-actualization, which is what we're doing here, right? We found this process, this experience, that actually brings us into this highest need for human development. I think it's fascinating that, you know, that's actually part of the psychological literature. So, when I started working with Trillium on myself and understanding it and things like that, I started noticing that certain things were taking place. We're all having this human experience, right? And if you think about it, right, we're these very fragile, fleshy, watery beings who find ourselves in a pretty dangerous world, right? We're very fragile. And yet we find ourselves in this rather violent, unpredictable, uncontrollable existence. It's just the way it is. So what happens? What do we do? Well, we, we, first of all, we live a little bit dissociated from the truth of our human experience. We live a little bit dissociated in different ways, through our own strategies, our own ways of being that. And good... Or a lot dissociated. <laughs> right. And good for us, right? Good for us that we have found a way to manage the reality of being so fragile and being in a kind of dangerous place, right? Um, and as we grow up as children, you know, we're all in families, you know, that have their own rules and things going on, right? We develop different survival strategies 
in our families. We learn how to, what works to get us love and attention. You know, we learn that. And um, the culture itself has a huge influence on our lives. You know, the culture says life should be a certain way. I'll talk about this much more tomorrow, what the cultural influence is. But these factors really do determine uh, our belief system, the survival strategies that we develop along the way. We call them governing sentimentalities. I don't know if we still use that word, but we did at one point, right? But they're, they're essentially survival strategies that we figure out how to get through, how to survive, how to make it through life, considering all these different forces that are happening around us, right? Very common ones. Children who grow up in an alcoholic family, right? They often feel um, out of control because the family system is out of control. So they'll often develop strategies like being the perfect child. If I'm, they believe, if, if I'm perfect, if I'm really perfect, then somehow this will be better, right? Or maybe I can even fix this, right? Or the good person, the good boy or girl, right? If I'm really, really good, maybe I can do that. Or sometimes they will develop a strategy to keep everything in order, right? Because everything is so out of control, if I, if I can uh, control my world, that will help me feel better. But these are strategies to deal with what's happening around them. And again, good for us that we figure this out, right? Um, I grew up, when I became an adolescent, right, I was aware of same-sex attractions, right? So my strategy was I was going to hide what I was feeling. So I split off what I felt inside and what I showed the world. That was my survival strategy, and it worked. I got through, right? I got into my adulthood. Of course, these strategies sometimes, you know, when you become adults into relationships, then you try to kind of reintegrate them very often. They don't work so well. But it's just an example of a strategy that I developed that was important at that time, right? We all do it. Good for us. So then, so then we come to a process like truly I'm awakening, right? And I have to say, it's astonishing what this transmission is capable of. It's astonishing what this transmission can do. We come to a process like Trillium. We ex start to experience the Trillium's transmission. And two things begin to happen. First, we start to become more embodied, right? Now, this can be a real problem, right? Because here we are in this human experience, a little bit dissociated, and we, this transmission starts bringing us into our bodies, right? It's kind of taken us to a place we're not quite sure we really want to go, <laughs> right? And at the same time, the transmission starts opening us to more expanded awareness, more consciousness, right? Which for some can be really wonderful and others can be very, very disorienting. I'm, if you're really used to being inside this body and you know, having these boundaries that are clear and you start experiencing this opening of awareness, it can be very, very disorienting, right? Well, the embodiment piece, what tends to happen, and this is a very classic psychotherapy situation, of clients come in my office, for example, and they're very much in their heads, they're very ungrounded, they're, you, know, you can tell that they're not embodied. You're laughing, you, you must be a therapist, <laughs> right? Often the first thing I'll do is work with them to get them here, to get them into their bodies, to help them ground and help them be more present into their embodied experience, right? So in that way, the transmission is doing what 
I do as a therapist. It's doing it automatically. It's bringing people into their bodies. But the problem is, or maybe not the problem, but what happens along the way is whatever is stopping us from being embodied starts to come up to the surface. It starts to be released, right? Often it's emotional. We start feeling emotions maybe that we've kind of tucked away for various reasons. And we all have learned how to do that. Sometimes it's physical. You know, if anyone has done any trauma research, trauma is actually held in the body. It's physical. It's not really that cognitive. And the other piece around trauma is that trauma is not caused by the traumatic experience. It's caused because the organism never had a chance to complete its response to the experience, right? It's an interesting detail, but it's very, very important to kind of acknowledge that because the truth is we self-regulate. We're wired to heal. We self-regulate. It's just what we do if we allow ourselves to have that experience. Trauma is caused because we interrupt it. I'm mentioning this because as part of this embodiment process, we can experience physical releases, movements, different types of things. And this is just the body releasing things it doesn't want, doesn't need. It's wanting to release and let go of so that it can be even more embodied. The other piece around this is the consciousness piece. It's pretty amazing. So we start to experience ourselves as more expanded. There's an awareness that we're much larger. So our infinite nature starts to show up. That can be really disorienting to people, right? Like, what do I do with this, right, kind of thing. So I think it all highlights in many ways the importance of being with people who can support these experiences and understand what they are and you know, just kind of hold each other through it. You're not going crazy or you know, this is just what it is, you know, that kind of thing. Um, green lighting. Green lighting is a tremendously powerful therapeutic technique, in my opinion. It's, you know, the, the way that I hold it, it's practicing radical self-acceptance. I will accept whatever comes up. I will just accept, you know, this is coming up. I don't have to push it away. I don't have to judge it. I don't have to make it bad or wrong. I can just accept it as it is. And it is kind of radical because most psychotherapies come from a more pathological place, right? The whole Freudian psychoanalytic tradition was really a medical model. You know, they were trying to treat what they called hysteria at the time. But it was a very pathological orientation. And a lot of mental health still subscribes to that model, you know? Psychiatric help is about getting rid of symptoms. Oh, you're having this experience? Let's get rid of it, right? It's the opposite of, it's like red lighting. <laughs> no, don't go there. So in some ways, this practice of green lighting, you know, it's kind of radical. I'm going to allow my experience to be what it is, right? I'm going to accept it. I'm going to honor it and respect it and acknowledge it. And in so doing, especially in the context of a trillium group, let's say, I can green light your experience too. So I can let go of judgment. I can let go of making you wrong or bad or in some way better or worse. I can just green light who you are. It's wonderful. Green lighting is not permission to act out. I'm feeling really angry today, so I'm going to take it out on Garth. It's not a permission to hurt or act out or um, 
be intrusive or exploitive of anybody, but it is permission to really own and respect and acknowledge your own experience. Green lighting is also about being known, bringing ourselves forward. So we're green lighting ourselves in the world. It's not just what's happening internally, you know, our thoughts and our feelings, and our experiences. We're also green lighting ourselves into the world, right? So we often, you know, we'll hide ourselves or judge ourselves, but we won't bring ourselves into the world as we are. And one of the brilliant things about this work is just acknowledging our imperfection. No one is perfect. We're all, you know, imperfectly or perfectly human, however you want to be. And to really honor ourselves and bring ourselves as we are into the world. This is the brilliance of the small group work that we do here. It's brilliant because we've created a safe, loving container, right, where we can actually show up differently. We can risk, I can risk showing you parts of myself that I hide in the world. I can take that risk and let you see the truth of me, right? So I'm essentially green lighting myself. I'm bringing more of me into the world. And it's a really, really incredibly important part of this work, which we'll be doing in the small groups the whole week. Um, I believe, and this is from my uh, Gestalt training, that being in the present moment, living in the present moment, is a healthy, happy place to be, right? That the present, being really present to myself and other in this moment is the epitome of health. That's as good as it gets. And what I've learned to uh, come to know is that when I'm fully present in that way, it's almost like things are just joyful. They just are, sometimes ecstatic, you know, just to be fully, fully present. And I think that's, in, in large measure, what this work ultimately guides us into. Just being fully present in this moment as I am with myself, and with you. What a beautiful gift, right? Beautiful gift. Um, mutuality. So when we meet in mutuality groups, right, and we're having this experience of just being held without judgment, without pathologizing, without trying to make you something you're not, right? In many ways, what's happening here psychotherapeutically, it's a reparenting process, right? Because most of us, you know, let's face it, we grew up and many of us are parents. There's no such thing as unconditional love. <laughs> There's all kinds of conditions, you know, because we're trying to get our kids to do this or that and be good and successful. I mean, it's just the way it works. So we've all kind of um, had very conditional parenting along the way. And that's, and that's fine. We come here and then there's a kind of reparenting process that takes place, right? I can just be who I am here with you. That's marvelous because it forces me to confront the ways that I've kind of judged myself or the tricks I use to um, you know, get love and attention and all that stuff, because I don't really need it here. So I can, I can really see it much more clearly and dare to let it go and just be much more real, right? Um, mutuality groups, we can have much healthier dynamic relationships, you know? I can be honest with you. I can tell you how I'm really feeling and be heard not be judged for it, you know? Um, so the practice of mutuality is often to take a risk. You know, I can say to a Juliet, you know, um, I was feeling really uncomfortable about something that happened with you yesterday. And 
and she could say, well, thanks for letting me know, right? Rather than often in the past, people would become defensive or, you know, angry or all, all this other stuff. We can actually explore what a healthy relationship dynamic feels like. My God, it's incredible, right? What an incredible gift. So these are all the risks we can take in the small groups and the medium-sized group as well. But I think the small group is even more geared toward that. And just to encourage you to take risks. You know, it's almost like we're in this sacred laboratory. And we have this opportunity to try out different behaviors and try out different ways of being in relationship with people, right? It's an amazing gift that we have here with ourselves. So as we stay in this process, embodiment, consciousness, at some point, we start experiencing the core paradox. Right? I can't highlight enough how important this experience is. I've never seen it or heard of it in any psychological literature. There's something brilliant about what Samuel Bonder was able to name here. All right? So the core paradox is the unbearable tension. I use that word consciously. Unbearable tension between our limited human experience and our infinite divine experience. So where those two places meet, right, or where they kind of come together, the experience is of this very, very difficult place of tension. That's essentially what the core paradox is. We often experience it as how hard it is to be here, right? how difficult being human is. I remember I was on the Transfiguration Retreat in California several years ago, and I went to a morning meditation. And I'm sitting, I'm trying to meditate, I'm feeling restless and irritable, and I don't really want to be here. I don't think maybe I should just get up and move. But I had the consciousness to say, to just investigate. I said, what's going on? And what I noticed when I stayed with the restlessness a little bit, I could feel myself drop. I felt myself just drop into my body in a, in a different way. And in that dropping, I, I just felt it. I felt it's really, really hard to be human. And I opened my eyes and I looked around the room and I had this experience of just seeing everybody in the exact same dilemma. And everyone was ju just doing the best they could. Just doing the best they could to deal with this. And I just felt this tremendous compassion for all of us, for what we were doing. And I think that was the, that was the most conscious experience that I had of this place of core paradox. There's something about this experience that when we really allow ourselves to drop into it, it's almost like a doorway into some opening. Opening into consciousness, opening into deeper embodiment. I can't cognitively explain it, but experientially it seems that it has this tremendous power to open up something deep inside ourselves. And I'm mentioning this because it will probably show up in some way this week. Good for you. And I'm just inviting you not to run away from it, but just to be with it. We will hold you in these places. We will, we're good at that. We're very skilled people at holding each other in these places. And I really invite you just to allow yourself to be with it and experience the openings that are available when you allow yourself to just go to the very uncomfortable places inside. 
Does that help? Yeah, good. Um, and also, then, at some point, we open into whole being realization, right? I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Um, my piece tomorrow um, really goes into this a little bit more when I talk about trust in being. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm just going to leave that there for now. <laughs>